when there would be a Fed pivot, it will be not, you know, announced like in a Fed meeting like this. <laughs> I cannot imagine to, to, to see Powell coming out at a Fed press conference and saying, okay, we do the pivot right now. No, it's not the case. It's always going to be an event, a shock event that will force the Federal Reserve to, to pivot or other central banks. I believe um, what will be the pivotal morning, uh, moment is an emergency meeting. What will be triggering the emergency meeting? Yet, I can't say you what this event will be. One could be that the regional banking crisis is popping up again. And at this time, they cannot inject money again. They have to come up with something else. The other, let's say, uh, catalyst for that could be Ukraine. Um, if we see a further escalation of the war, turning from, let's say, a proxy war um, between the US and Russia into a direct conflict, into a hot war. That could be also the catalyst. All right, welcome to the RTD interview. Today, I'm excited to have returning guest, Mr. Oliver Reich. He is the founder of Tradewiser Markets, a pioneer in platform delivery, insightful daily macro and technical analysis. And today, he's joining us to share his thoughts on the economy, as well as a lot of insights on the financial markets. So once again, Oliver, welcome back to RTD interviews. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me back. Yes, I appreciate you joining me. And so it's been a it's been a long time since we've last connected. And so I figure it's about time to reach out to you because a lot of things happening in the European economy. And over on this side, we don't get any really any real detailed information as to what's going on. So I'm looking forward to connecting with you and getting your thoughts on where we're at now and where things are heading. But before we dive further, if you don't mind, for those who might be new to the community, can you share with us a little of your background and how you arrived at this point in your career? Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, so I've been more for more than five years right now in investment converting on a freelance basis. So I provide basically consultation to individuals and also to corporates um, in form of, let's say, investment advice, what they, where they maybe want to locate at, where, where they want to put their money at. And um, also I'm providing brokerage services. That means uh, money is seeking, I mean, uh, there are companies. Um, raise, need to have funds, um, need to raise funds, and they are reaching out to me if I know any investors willing to invest into their companies or into their projects. So that's one of um, the parts as an investment consultant. And But I'm also a blogger, so I'm running my own blog, like you already mentioned in the intro, so tradewisersmarkets.com, where I provide almost daily analyzers on the S&P 500 or generally on the, S uh, on the U.S. equities. And uh, that's basically what I'm be what I've been doing since more than five years. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, thank you for sharing that. And so um, I appreciate you taking time to join me. So I am I am a subscriber to uh, your your newsletter. So I appreciate what you do because I do check it uh, when you do send it out. And so uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, on where we're at now. And so you're in Germany now, and of course the economy is not doing too good. We've <laughs> been hearing about recession on this side of the pond, but we don't get any in depth information so share with us i guess some of the concerns you might have or some things of that nature and we'll just go from there yeah sure i mean may you you may have heard that we have um had a, a negative gdp growth now for two times in a row or two consecutive um, gdp growths in a row and that um, is technically said to be in a recession and so um we are um, if you think of the G20, that means the, the most powerful nations in the world regarding GDP, um, we are the only GDP nation of this um, club of G20 um, that uh, has a negative GDP growth. And that tells you how the current state of Germany is in comparison to G20 members. Now, at this current moment, uh, by you guys not being in the best predic predicament here, Germany has been known as a staple of Europe. And wherever Germany goes, Europe tends to follow. And so at this current moment, is it good to say that based upon what Germany's at now, EU is not in the greatest you know, condition as well? Yes, uh, overall, um, it has something to do with the outbreak of the Ukraine war in 2020. So last year, we are now in August 2023. And last year in February, when the Ukraine war was breaking out, basically European has been come under a lot of pressure because of all those sanctions that has been hit with Russia. But also, you know, the, the biggest uh, chunk of these um, sanctions was hitting, uh, let's say, Germany and the European economy itself. Uh, it was kind of a terrible decision for the German economy. Why? And because Germany was um, the, the only country 
um, along with France, but um, Germany especially, the only country that had really tight business relationship with uh, Russia and was also one of the biggest importer of energy, cheap energy from Russia. You heard it maybe that um, there was a Nord Stream pipeline where Germany was basically directly connected to Russia, importing this cheap energy and the whole business model was built on cheap energy. And that was basically overnight when the Ukraine war was breaking out last year, cut in pieces. And ever since, uh, you know, we were, let's say, pushed um, into the LNG terminal. Um, uh, so basically they wanted us to import uh, energy, not most so cheap from Russia, but now from, let's say, overseas, especially from America. That's why the US economy was quite doing very well, especially the, the oil companies when this war was breaking out. Interesting. Now, at this current moment, uh, I remember hearing about over the last winter that it was going to be really cold in Europe in particular. So I guess, is there the same concerns of the energy crises heading into this winter as well? And will it, it, has things gotten better for the most part or, or are they a lot worse in reference to the energy? Yeah, you are hitting a very good point. So last year we had, to, look, already last year, there was, you know, the biggest concern in Germany and also in Europe that um, we will get a very hot winter. That was not coming true. We, especially in Germany last year, last winter, we got a really warm winter and um, uh, there was no winter at all. It was a very warm climate and we were all very surprised by that. And of course, there was no need um, to have a lot of gas or energy to have our heater on. Um, but this year, um, it seems or it appears to us that the climate is getting more rough and um, we have even colder summer right now going on. We have more rain, um, very um, unusual, um, very strong and very hot rain. Um, the climate is very rough in this year. Right now um, we had some sunny days, but it looks like um, based on the weather forecast for the next, um, let's say, a couple of days and uh, 14 days um, further, we will have again strong rain with some, let's say, um, up to hurricane um, situation or conditions. I don't think that this will come true, but um, they already, um, let's say, forecasted that we will get again a rough weather. And uh, and now speaking about this winter, we are now in August, and you you know uh, that energy companies always need to uh, plan ahead of the winter, already starting right now in in summertime or end of summertime, and it looks like. And this is uh, what the biggest concern is right now, that this winter will be not the same like it was last year, where we had a mild winter. This time, they really forecast that we will get a hard winter. And if this is the case, then, of course, we have to um, yeah, import more gas. But unfortunately, um, because uh, we are not more allowed to, I need to say this, so we are not more allowed to, to get energy from, or let's say gas from Russia, um, we are only dependent on, let's say, LNG terminal deliveries and from neighbor countries around to, to get gas, to, to heat up our heaters. Um, it looks like that we are not getting uh, the, the amount of uh, gas that we need to, to get over, let's say, a rough or hot winter. And that's a big issue right now. Right, right, right. Now, I'm curious to get your thoughts, I guess. What's the current uh, inflation figures uh, for Germany? Because I heard a lot about, I guess, the younger population not having employment and things of that nature. And a lot of the, you know, the talent from Germany was leaving and things of that nature. And so I guess at this current moment, if, if are things improving or are they getting worse to where you can say that the future of Germany is looking promising? And, and or will they end up pivoting towards the Eastern Hemisphere? Because I know that there is some question about them not uh, being necessarily for the sanctions per se. But do you think things are progressing or are things not trending positively, in your opinion? Well, based on the current uh, CPI number, so remember uh, NZS, for example, is the current CPI or the latest um, CPI was 3.2%. Uh, ticked up a little bit and it's um, above the inflation target of 2% in the US. Uh, still a little bit high, but uh, came a little bit lower in and is nearing to the inflation target. And in Germany, it's totally so different. Yes, inflation has come down, but it's still at 6.2%. That's the latest mm -hmm. number from, let's say, last month. Uh, of course, they are now about to, to report the, um, the latest ones. 
but uh, that was um, based on the last records I was reading, 6.2%. And we also have with the ECB, that is basically having the same inflation target like the Federal Reserve with 2%. So uh, if you put together 6.2% versus uh, 2%, we are still way, way too high with CPI or with inflation in Germany. And you can even see this. If I'm going to the grocery right now, um, yes, um, the, the prices are coming down a little bit, but if you, if there's a, let's say we, we have a special grocery that is now also becoming very popular in America. It's called Aldi. And there's one special um, a product that uh, most of German know very well. It's about a, a special vegetable that was priced um, a year ago about, let's say 50 cents or 40 cents. And now when you go and want to buy the same product, even inflation has come down a little bit, it's twice the price. So it's near 80 cents. And, and that is, of course, something where you can understand that something maybe is coming down, but not the way like everyone expected. Um, what most people don't understand, when inflation year over year basis is coming down, um, it doesn't mean that the inflation from the previous year is also less than this year that we have. Because last year, when, or let's say in 2021, when, when this inflation started to pick up, we, we have built a new base. So on this new base, we are, let's say, bringing on the new inflation. So that's why we are always talking about year over year inflation um, in, in form of the CPI, for example. That means only that one year, uh, or let's say in comparison to the previous year, we were up only 6% or 6.2% in that case. But from 2022 to 2023, we had already a higher base on inflation. That's what most people uh, still don't think about. Yeah, inflation is still too high. Right. And there's one guy, uh, maybe you heard about him. He's Peter Schiff. Yeah, he's um, speaking exactly about this problem. He says basically that, uh, yes, uh, inflation may have come down, but inflation is still way too high and it's keep going higher from here. And uh, no matter what the central banks and the um, economies or the, let's say the central bankers are doing, because at some point inflation will pick up again. And I um, agree to this, uh, let's say, opinion. Um, regarding the, the overall um, economy decision, I mean, what was your second question, sir, Egan? I, I was just mentioning about uh, just the, the health of the economy moving forward. You know, if things don't change, you know, are, are, are German expectations that things will get worse before they get better? Yeah. Yeah. So we had also, you know, we, we are measuring our uh, economy also in form of the industrial production. And that has been negative um, based on the last figure that we got. Uh, we were minus 1.7 percent. So we are in a contractionary mode. And of course, uh, there is a reason for that. Um, like that and that has something to do with the Ukraine war. So with the outbreak of the Ukraine war, so the, imagine like this, so the entire um, German economy is his business model or its business model is based or was based on cheap energy. So it's this cheap energy we got from Russia for a very long time in form of the pipelines that were coming in form of gas from, let's say, Russia directly to Germany. And that has been cut in 2020. So especially in February 2020 or a month later, remember, um, by the way, President Biden, he was uh, speaking back then that um, there will be no more, let's say, pipeline or there will be no more um, Nord Stream. Um, that was before the outbreak of the Ukraine war. Uh, there is a good reason for that, because you you knock out a competitor. So in that case, Germany, when you, you know, you you get him away from cheap energy and you are forcing him to, to take on now the, the higher price energy from overseas. And that's what's going on. That's why the, the companies that were, let's say, highly dependent on this cheap energy uh, are, are not more producing or coming up with their costs. So the, the, the costs are increasing, revenue is declining because uh, companies um, seeing that um, there is not more so much business to do. We are losing business um, to Russia. Um, we have to find new partners, but those new partners are not more so interested in making business with German companies because um, of the higher prices. And that's how you lose not only revenues, but also the, the costs are increasing. And that's how the whole business model is blowing up in your face. And that's what's going on right now. And we see this in, in terms of the uh, GDP growth that has been for two quarters right now negative and by the way the projection is that it keeps negative so there will be another gdp growth in the negative for the next quarter projected
Wow, wow, wow. Now, I'm curious to get your thoughts on the current, you know, the, just the bond market in general. You know, yields are spiking pretty much globally, it seems. And so as a result of all these issues, you know, within economies, governments are taking on more debt, borrowing costs are rising. So the whole QT model seems to be taking us down a pathway where there's no, there's no, there's no safe ending to none of this. So give, give me your thoughts on just overall debt market and, you know, our, our, you know, especially U.S. Treasuries. Are they still considered risk-free assets that's worth holding on to? Or what are your thoughts on the whole debt market? Uh, yes, uh, look, I, I know, uh, look, I'm also kind of a defender um, of, let's say, the, um, that when you have too much debts, of course, at some point it's blowing up in your face. But uh, we shouldn't forget that the Federal Reserve has the hegemony of the world with its currency and this is the US dollar. As long as this is the case, they can print money as much as they want. So. It doesn't even matter. I, I know it sounds more ridiculous, but yes, the, the, there is a national debt outstanding of more than $32 trillion uh, as the time of speaking here right now. I think even we are approaching $33 uh, trillion of dollars, mm -hmm. um, very soon. Yes, and these, uh, of course, when you have high rates, then you have to pay a higher interest. So I was reading about some um, let's say statistics that uh, when the US government or when the rates are keeping high like this right now, but at some point the, the amount that um, has been put up for, let's say, paying those interests um, is almost achieving a trillion dollars. And yes, it's high. And yes, it will, of course, put more debts on the US economy. So we will be easily approaching, I think, at some point, 40 trillion, maybe even 50 trillion. And think about that. We, we will have to bail out the economy at some point again. That means the Fed will print money at some point again. And yes, they can do this because they have the reserve currency. And as long as this is the case, that they have the, the word reserve currency, they can print money as much as they want. And mm -hmm. so they can, you know, um, yeah, um, put up more debts. Yes, it will be higher. You have to pay more interest. But hey, who cares? No one cares now, as long as you have the power over the currency. Right, and I, and I, and I understand how that has been the prevailing narrative forever. But yet, when you have a lot of other nations, you know, deciding to dial back on and uh, I guess get rid of some of that debt, the question then will be: Is the who's going to be the buyer? Like if you know that they're continually counterfeiting currency to prop up their the global you know hegemony of the dollar, at what point do nations say enough's enough, and do they decide to say let's come up with alternatives, and then that gets into the whole BRICS narrative of them coming out with their own currency, all that stuff like that. We'll wait and see, but at some point the world will say enough's enough, wouldn't you say, or or that's way down the line. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see it right now. There is a BRICS um, summit going on in South Africa right now, as the time of we are speaking, and. Exactly. This is one, let's say, biggest um, topic um, at the summit for the BRICS nations, because they, first of all, last year, everyone in the world saw what was going on with Russia. Yeah, with, Within just, let's say, a month, there were so many sanctions on Russia put, or they put so many um, sanctions on Russia, that they even uh, dismissed them from the SWIFT um, payment system. Uh, you, you heard about that, right? right SWIFT. So, right. so basically, uh, Russia is not more allowed to, to, to do transactions um, outside of Russia in, let's say, in SWIFT payment transaction system. So uh, SWIFT is a big deal. And so the, the other nations, they saw that. Yeah, They, they saw what they tried to do with uh, Russia. So they wanted to bring Russia down on its knees. Um, so that they cannot more, let's say, pay for the material that they ordered from neighbor countries. Of course, they found a way. Um, but anyway, um, they, they wanted to do this because the U.S. has the hegemony, I mean, the power over the reserve currency. Um, so the BRICS, or so the other nations, especially China, China and also Brazil, and in that case, India too, they, they saw that and they said, okay, we have to stop this. We have to stop that um, the, the US dollar will be abused against us. What if we are the next candidates? So what if we do something that the US doesn't like, or the, the let's say, the, the so-called NATO allies, if they don't like what we will be doing? Uh, will they also put us out of the SWIFT system so that we can do more transactions? So we have to come up with an alternative currency. And that's what's going on right now behind the scenes, of course. Right. Now, because of that, I, I think that the long term role of U.S. debt liabilities are at stake 
the USD is going to be around forever like it has been for the last 200 some years. I think just the, the world will have alternatives in reference to how they conduct international trade. That minimum exchange will not solely be dependent upon the Federal Reserve system in the future. And so now we just wait and see what's happening. So I want to get into uh, opportunities. And so, of course, you mentioned gold and silver. And a lot of your uh, you know, people who are subscribers to you, they're concerned about what's, what's, what's considered safe in this current environment. What are you keeping an eye on? I guess what excites you as far as opportunities? whether it be trading or investing or whatever, what are some things you're keeping an eye on? Well, <laughs> I hate to say this, but the safest place right now is uh, really um, to be in treasuries. Because like I said to you, um, as long as, as the Federal Reserve is able to print money by its own, as, as long as there is no alternative currency, and you know, there is still no alternative currency that could compete to the US dollar. And it's as long as this is not the case, they can do whatever they want. So okay. I consider, U.S. Treasuries right now as the best place to, to save your money, uh, to put it in. And even for a very um, short period of time, you can earn. Uh, remember, where is the rate right now? The Fed funds rate 5.5 percent almost. So you can easily get for three months a 5.5 percent on your money risk free. Yeah. So and if you go with that in the equities right now, you, you are at risk. And um, as you see, um, Currently, um, the last time I was checking the markets, the S&P went down again and uh, now has been in a downtrend, in a longer uptrend that has been the case since the beginning of this year. So it's quite, let's say, an uncomfortable situation. And tomorrow, by the way, uh, today is uh, Tuesday. Tomorrow, um, NVIDIA, so the last mega cap stock, will be reporting earnings. Um, and usually, this comes, you know, with a top in the markets. Often, it is the case um, that um, usually when the last uh, mega cap stock is reporting earnings, often um, it comes with a top or short term top in the markets. I'm not calling for a complete crash, but uh, this could be, let's say, kind of a signal that more selling is coming. And if we also put this now forward, I mean, we have at the same time when Nvidia is reporting earnings, by the way, in the after hours, so it will come into effect on Thursday in the morning when the market's opening. We have also on Thursday the, the Jackson Hole Symposium um, with Fed Chairman Powell, who will be then also giving a speech. So put it all together, um, could be kind of a, let's say, uh, interesting situation that we will be facing starting on Thursday. Um, um, so the odds right, right now are favoring uh, more um, pressure to the downside. And so you better stay of the equity markets right now, you wait and just sit out uh, to see if the, if this correction is over. And if it's not, um, just wait and see so that valuation is coming down a little bit, that uh, all the bad news are going out, I mean, are out of the way. Um, maybe this is the best month to get invested again if you're a long-term investor is, let's say, around uh, October, but we need to see. And for gold and silver, it is always a, a good time to, to add up on both, let's say, um, two metals, um, because over the long term, yes, in, uh, we know that there are so-called inflation hedges. That's true. Um, but we also have seen that uh, inflation was picking up and what was coming down, gold and silver in prices. And <laughs> everyone was scratching their head. Hey, I, I thought it's considered to be an inflation hedge. Why then the, the prices or the value of gold and silver is coming down rather it's going up? It has something to do with the Federal Reserve, of course, um, as long as they are keep on um, the, the path of quantitative tightening, it will also hurt uh, gold and silver investors. But at some point, they have to shift. And this shift is something we are speculating on. And of course, um, we don't know yet uh, when this shift will be coming. So as long as this has not been the case, uh, it will be a painful road for, uh, let's say, all those gold and silver bucks. But we will be rewarded at some point when the shift will be coming because the quantitative easing program that will be following after those quantitative tightening that has been going on now for quite uh, two years, uh, almost two years, um, it will be even harder. And remember, um, we were just talking about this. We have um, interest payments to do of up to one trillion. So you can imagine how much uh, quantitative easing they have to do just to, to, to offset those interest payments and, of course, to inject uh, or to stimulate the economy. Mm, good point. Good point. Well, Oliver, as always, my friend, it's good to connect with you. Thank you for taking time to share your thoughts and analysis on where we're at. And it sounds like, you know, you're also anticipating that there will be a, some type of pivot uh, in the near future. If if something goes wrong, if something breaks, everyone's saying the Fed is going to break something with all this tightening, then the automatic response will be the easing that will come. And so do you think it's going to be as, as, as simple? 
based upon previous experiences where Marcus Tank, Fed comes in to save the day, and because all central banks, you know, globally are now also in the same kind of boat. Do you think it's going to be like a, a, a an entire all central banks deciding to ease at the same time or, or what? Last question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and fair question, because uh, what most people um, also, you know, I can read this on Twitter, on other blogs um, that are highly, let's say, um, uh, yeah, where you see a lot of messages and, of course, and opinions about the markets and where the sea markets going. Uh, all I can say is that when there would be a Fed pivot, it will be not, you know, announced like in a Fed meeting like this. <laughs> I cannot imagine to, to, to see Powell coming out at the Fed press conference and saying, OK, we do the pivot right now. No, it's not the case. It's always going to be an event, a shock event that will force the Federal Reserve to, to pivot or other central banks in the world, like we saw in the beginning of years, uh, this year in March. 2023, when the regional banks suddenly had issues. And by the way, this problem is not yet out of the way. It's still there, but no one is speaking more about this. Mm -hmm. um, so it will come back, this topic. Uh, and you know, right now there is earnings season and um, banks already reported earnings. And you can imagine that the next earnings report will be even more interesting to see how they were dealing with this high rate environment, uh, especially when they loaded up with let's say this is a long-term bonds that are now coming under more pressure. Um, it would be interesting to see, but I believe um, what will be the pivotal morning, uh, moment is an emergency meeting. What will be triggering the emergency meeting? Yet I can't say you what this event will be, but uh, let's speculate about this. One could be that the regional banking crisis is popping up again. And at this time, they cannot inject money again. They have to come up with something else. That would be one catalyst. I mean, that would be for things to the Fed or other central banks in the world, like the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, um, and even the ECB to, to pivot. Um, the other, let's say, uh, catalyst for that could be Ukraine. Um, if we see a further escalation of the war, turning from, let's say, a proxy war um, between the US and Russia into a direct conflict, into a hot war. That could be also the catalyst. Of course, I hope this is not coming true, especially from a European perspective. Um, but uh, we have to, you know, uh, we have to consider that that would, this could be also one of the reasons that could lead central banks to, to uh, let's say, to, to change the course and to, you know, to push the economy to to offset those, let's say, special situations like conflicts. Mm, interesting interesting well thanks for clarifying that so oliver as always my friend thank you for joining me and uh, looking forward to continue to follow your work and of course having you back on probably perhaps later this year and see where we're at and get your thoughts on all the european economy as well as all this brick stuff as it unwinds but uh, once again i'll leave all your information how people can connect with you in the description so they can uh follow your work as well and so other than that thank you for joining us on rtd interviews absolutely well the pleasure mike and good luck and good work with your job here yeah. I mean, good luck thank you. Yeah. good work <laughs> <So>. <laughs> thank you my friend appreciate you Talking to you soon again. Bye-bye.